I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. We're continuing our Just Jesus series where we're looking at the Gospel of Luke for the entire year. And uh, here we are at the end of August and we're still in the Gospel. So uh, Luke chapter 10. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1032 and you will find Luke chapter 10. And you'll be able to join with us in following along in the text. While you're finding Luke 10, uh, let me just acknowledge what we all know. Our world is a mess. Our world's a mess. I mean, it's filled with poverty, with violence, with disease, with terrorism, corruption. I mean, is there anybody here who thinks the world's perfect just the way that it is? I mean, it might be pretty good for you, and, and it's, uh, I know it's pretty good for me, but we know it's, it's broken, and, it, and it's not uh, what it would be. So how many of you would like to see the world we live in get better? Yeah, all of us. We want to see the world get better. Now, biblically, we know that that's God's plan, is that one day He is going to completely remake the world that we live in. He's going to create a new heaven and a new earth, and everyone who uh, is a follower of Christ is going to get a new body, and we're going to live in that place, and it's going to be perfect. There's going to be no more suffering, sorrow, death, or pain, because that old order of things is done away with. And so that's our hope, that's our reality that we know we're headed for. But in the meantime, I believe that God is calling us his followers, to make this world a better place. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus, then you have an opportunity to change the world. Think about this. There's about 2 billion people on this planet who call themselves Christians. Okay, they self-identify as, as Christians. And I'm not going to judge whether they are or aren't because that's not my job to do that. But just imagine how much better the world would be if all two billion of them, of us, actually did what Jesus instructed us to do. That, that world would be a much better place, wouldn't it? But here's the thing. We can't control them. We can only control us. Our decisions. We're not accountable for their choices. We're accountable for our choices. And I can only choose for me. You can only choose for you. So I have to decide, am I going to listen to Jesus and change the world for myself and for the people around me? And are you going to listen to Jesus and allow him to change the world through you? Here's how we can change the world. Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. Very familiar story to those of us who grew up in church. Parable of the Good Samaritan, you've heard it taught lots of times, Sunday school classes, sermons, all that kind of stuff. If you didn't grow up in church, you've heard this story referenced many times, even if you didn't know where it came from. This is the source. So here it is. It says, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test. Pause right there. A lawyer in this context is somebody, not a legal expert, but somebody who studies the law of God. In other words, he was a biblical scholar who, who knew what Moses taught in the Old Testament. They didn't call it that. They just called it the law. So he was a lawyer. So he stood up to test Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? <laughs> don't you love that? Jesus goes, You're a lawyer. What does the law say? Why don't you tell me? So he says, What's written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Pause there. This was not some brilliant treatise that the guy came up with. This statement that he makes is called the Shema, and it's what every good Jewish boy and girl of about the age of five would be able to quote. In other words, he shared with them a children's response, and it's the correct response. And Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? So Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. 
And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? And the lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Now, a very familiar story, the Good Samaritan, and everybody who hears that goes, okay, we get that. We're supposed to help people stranded on the side of the road. Well, helping people stranded on the side of the road may be a good thing to do. It's not the point of the story. Jesus is not commanding us to form a spiritual AAA. Okay? That, that's not the point. Uh, that doesn't, doesn't mean you shouldn't help people, but I, I'm just saying that's not the point of the story. The point is, love God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. Right? Jesus said, what does the law say about eternal life? Well, love the Lord your God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, if you do this, you'll have life. If you do this, you'll live. You'll have life abundant, life eternal, because you'll be connected to God, and you'll be living in His glory and in His power, and He will change the world through you. And the lawyer tried to defend his life. Well, who's my neighbor? Who does this apply to? Who do I really have to love? Um, Now, like us, he was probably hoping for a really simple, passive answer. I'm I'm guessing that, that he would really like Jesus just to say, well, to love your neighbor means that you don't hate anybody and you're polite in public and uh, you just ignore most people. But that's not what Jesus said to do. He makes it very clear what it means to love our neighbor. And since we want life, at least I'm assuming for you, that you really want the abundant life that God is talking about in this passage, then we need to hear what Jesus teaches. So catch this. First of all, to love your neighbor is to see them with compassion. See them with compassion. Right? Jesus tells the story, verses 31 through 33. Guy gets beaten up, left for half dead. First guy comes by, he's a priest. Sees him, crosses the other side of the road, walks on by. Next guy comes by, he's a Levite. Sees him, crosses the other side of the road, walks on by. Third guy comes by, he's a Samaritan. Sees him and has what? Compassion on him. And takes care of him, helps him. Three men passed, everyone saw him, but only one saw him with compassion. Now what's interesting is uh, we miss the impact of the story in the culture that it was set in. Because when Jesus said a priest and a Levite came by, those are the good guys. They're the special guys. They're the guys who represent God to the people there in Israel. They're the ones who get to walk in the temple and serve God and bring the sacrifices to him and go into the holy place that other people can't go. In other words, they had special status. They were the spiritual ones. They were the good guys. And Jesus said they just passed on by. In other words, if Jesus was telling the story to us, he'd probably call him, instead of a priest and a Levite, a pastor and a deacon. People that you would expect to help. But then the third guy comes by, and he's a Samaritan. And that has no emotional impact on us at all, because all our lives we've heard about being a good Samaritan. In fact, they named, like, you know, hospitals after that for a while. And, and because we have this connotation, that's a good guy, that's somebody who helps. But in reality, to the audience that Jesus was talking to, when he said Samaritan, he was invoking the, the, the people that the Jews hated. They were the enemies. They were people that were brought in by the Assyrians and planted right in the middle of the Jewish nation. And, and they worshipped God wrong, and they, and they were, uh, you know, half-breeds, and they didn't like the Jews, and the Jews didn't like them. It would be like if he was telling the story here. He said, okay, the pastor and the deacon walked on by, and then the atheist came by and helped him. And we'd go, oh, that's not the story we want to hear. Or from an American perspective, you know, two Americans walked by, and and then the communist came and helped him. Well, we don't like that. Or in today's world, you know, somebody from ISIS came by and showed compassion on him. And we'd go, no, that's our enemy, and they don't do that. And Jesus is trying to shock the crowd going, hey, are you seeing people with compassion? It doesn't matter what label you hang on yourself. What matters is how you act toward people. 
So do you see the people in your life? Your family, your friends, your coworkers, the, the people that you drive around, you know, because they're in cars around you, the, the people that you see at, at restaurants and grocery stores and in life, do you see the people? And you're going, yeah, of course we see the people. But how do you see them? How do you see them? Do you see people as your neighbor or do you see people as a nuisance? Do you see people as an opportunity to bless and to serve and to help? Or do you see them as an obstacle to what you want? You see, how do we see people? If we're going to love like Jesus and we have to see people like Jesus saw them. Gospel of Matthew chapter 9 says that Jesus saw the crowds and he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, if we're going to see people with compassion, we have to confront our busyness. Busyness. It's not really a word. I just kind of made it up, but you get what I mean. We're blinded to the needs of other people because we are so consumed by our schedules and our tasks and our agendas and our appointments and our needs. We're consumed with our selfishness and our schedule reveals it because we don't have time to be compassionate. So we cross the street, we pass by on the other side, we ignore people. And let's be honest, when we do take the time and look at people, a lot of times we just judge them, right? We judge them by how they dress. We judge them by how they look. We judge them by the job they have or the job they don't have. We judge them by the car they drive. We judge them by the way they drive their car. At least I do. And if we want to see people with compassion, then we have to stop judging people. And to stop judging people means we have to know their story. You know, everyone in this room has a story. God's working in your life. God's doing something in your life. You're going through trials. You're going through celebrations. You've got uh, the issues. You got, every one of us is a work in progress. But the only way we know that is to take the time to listen to the stories around us. But see, to do that, we have to stop judging, and that requires compassion. And we don't have time for that. But there's only one good guy in this story. Do you see people like he saw people or like the others? Because to love our neighbor is to see them with compassion, and secondly, it's to serve them. If we're going to love our neighbor, we have to serve them. Verse 34 tells us what the Samaritan did when he saw him and had compassion. It said he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. In other words, the Samaritan served him by taking care of his needs he put the man's needs ahead of his own agenda. To love your neighbor is to live life as a servant. Um, now, our world, and oftentimes we're caught up in this too, our world's really fond of Jesus' light. You know, it's like they, they, they like kind of what Jesus teaches, but without the truth and all the conviction. And a lot of times we do too, and, and you see it in things like this. So, you know, people go, oh, well, you know, we're we going to pay it forward. Right? We, we want to uh, do random acts of kindness. We want to volunteer. And, and, uh, and a lot of times people do that so that they feel better about themselves. It's kind of like serving therapy. It's not, I'm not really interested in what it does for you. I'm really interested in what it does for me. Uh, now, listen, I... I I am for all those things. I'm really for people paying it forward, especially when I'm in the car behind them. Okay? That's just, isn't that great? When that happens to you, you're like, yes, score. But, I, you know, I'm all for random acts of kindness. I'm, I'm all for volunteering. Uh, but I'm for those things as a lifestyle, not as an occasional thing that we do. You see, to love is not to occasionally serve. To love is to serve people when they need it, not just when we have time or make time. It's an attitude to live by, not an event to attend. And, and this whole serving thing is really hard for us because it confronts our selfishness. 
You know, uh, every one of us is a sinner, and every one of us is selfish at the very core of our being. I know it, for me, it, it's down deep. It's hardwired into my, my soul, which is why I need to be redeemed by Jesus and why it's going to be that way until I get a new body and, and I'm recreated in His image. And, and, and so I've got to confront that selfishness that's in me, and God prescribes serving as a way for us to confront that selfishness. And, and truthfully, you can even serve selfishly. Right? Have you, have you ever noticed that some people really like recognition when they do stuff? In fact, they only do it for the recognition, or they, they want to do it for the attaboys and the applause and the people who say, who say, good job. You see, loving others requires us to serve whether we signed up for it or not. Loving others means that we're going to serve whether we feel like it or not, or whether we get recognition or not. And the truth is, we're not really used to that. And so we have to kind of train ourselves. We need help learning how to be servants. And that's one of the reasons that Calvary serves our community. Now, the first reason we serve our community is because we love our neighbors. And we want them to meet the life-changing power of Jesus Christ in their lives. And so we serve them. But the second reason that we serve them is because none of us are naturally servants. And we need to learn how to do that. And so we kind of provide opportunities to help us learn how to love like Jesus loves. Because if we love like Jesus, what happens? We get life. Do this and you will live. And so we want everyone to have life abundant. And so we want to help you learn how to serve. So when we invite you to sign up for the Serve ministry here at Calvary. By the way, you may not know this. We have an entire ministry called Serve. You can sign up for it on calvarylhc.com. Click the Serve tab. And then you can go in there and you can say, hey, I want to serve and here's what I'm good at and here's how I want to help and here's when I'm available. And we will invite you to join us in serving. We will tell you about opportunities there are for you to serve. And, and here's the thing. We don't expect you to show up for all of them, but we'll just invite you so that you know it's, it's available for you. And, and we offer a class called Equip once a month. It's going to be offered next month on the 10th, I think. Uh, and, uh, and, and in that class, we try to teach you the biblical principles of serving and Calvary's values about how to represent us to the world. And, and we offer those things because we, we want to help you learn how to be a servant. And we plan serving events and opportunities to help you change our world by loving your neighbor like Jesus challenged us. And as part of this emphasis, today we're launching a brand new ministry focused on foster kids, uh, foster care. Uh, in Mojave County, there's a need for families to do foster care. We had like 536 kids last year in foster care in Mojave County, and 180 of them had to be placed outside of Mojave County, had to be placed in Phoenix or Tucson or someplace else because we don't have enough families to take them in. And yet, these are children who are vulnerable and who need some people who can love them, who can serve them by caring for them and, and providing for them and hopefully reconciling their families so that their family can be reunited and whole. And I believe that God is calling some of us to be involved in foster care ministry. This is a real passion uh, of Pastor O.C., our family pastor. And he's heading this up. And, and I want you to really think about whether God would have you to be involved in this ministry. And while you're thinking about that, I want you to watch this video of some people just like us who are doing this at their church down in Phoenix. Fostering was always something that I was interested in doing, um, even as a young adult, because I figured there were too many kids out there that you know, didn't have families that would be able to love them. I had always wanted to foster. It was always something, I have a mom's heart, I always have, and I just wanted to be able to love on kids. Just love on children and show them Jesus and show them that Jesus loves them. Just the love that comes back from the love that you give. We look at it as we have a window of opportunity that God has given us to work with the child. We don't know how long they're going to be in the family, but we feel it's our responsibilities. And I'll even say that it's the church's responsibility, all of us together, to try to minister to this child, to reunify the family, and who knows, now the family may be start attending the church itself. Well, our hearts have to be prepared to receive families that are really hurting. Um, we have to receive those kids without knowing, well, we might know this much of what's gone on in their lives, but we know there's this much that we don't know. And um, just knowing that the Lord has them there for a reason and um, whatever we can do to love them 
um, to show them Jesus, to proclaim the gospel to them, because we don't know if they'll be back. Also loving on the kids, but loving on the biological parents as well. The mom started to come to church with us. Now that was really we, cool. We asked her to come to church and she started coming to church with her three boys. That's really awesome. That's so good for the kids to see that. And I think that's so critical, um, but that support from the church and from the ministries that are within the church um, play just a vital role as, as us in the house here. Um, there, so there are tons of ways that, that families can get involved in that. Supporting of foster kids and foster parents. I think that it's improved the ministry in the, in the kids' wing because it helps us remember this might be our only opportunity. Love we felt from the church was huge. It was huge. And you can't do this. You cannot do foster care without a support system. And when we've had church people come along, we've been more effective. It can be difficult. It can be hard. But to see what you did at the end, it's worth it. And, and if you're waiting to where you feel like you're gonna be the perfect foster parent, you can, you can wait forever, you know? It's just, are you willing to step out there and trust that God's gonna be with you? I mean, that's what's gotten us through 15 years. If you know for sure that this is your calling in life and you've got a heart and a passion for this, don't let fear ruin that. You know, it's pretty um, awesome. They're gonna actually have a regular life for a little while, you know, while, while we're raising them. It's to love the kids like they're never going home, even if they do. Um, they need that, that stability and that love. They come from such chaos. There's a child in there that needs love. And, you know, that's what we feel like God's called us to do. Whatever their situation, whatever their circumstances, that child, the bottom line is they need love. You know, I believe that God is calling some of us in this room to be involved in the ministry of foster care. And, and if that's you, then right after the service, uh, out at the Main Lobby Connection Center, Pastor O.C. is going to be out there, and you can sign up for more information. It's not a commitment, but it's saying, hey, I want to know about this ministry, and I, I want to go through the training. There's a lot of training involved in foster care ministry. It's not easy to, to be approved, but it's worth it, especially for the lives that can be changed, and we're all about life change. Uh, also, if, if you're sitting here listening to this going, yeah, but I'm, uh, I don't know that I have the energy to really invest myself fully in being a foster parent, then maybe you can be a foster grandparent. Uh, because every one of these families that is involved in foster care is going to need somebody to come alongside them and encourage them and babysit for them and maybe do some shopping for them and help them out. And maybe you're saying, hey, I want to be that person. I want to help out and, and really uh, support those people who are committing to, to be foster parents. Then you go back and sign up and say, hey, I want to be that person that provides that help. But, but one of the things about this, this ministry that really grabs me is this. I talk to so many people who think they don't have gifts that God can use to, to make a life-changing difference. And I argue with them because I point out how every person that you influence uh, is a God opportunity. It's ministry, and it's valuable. But here's the thing. Some of you think, oh, I don't have any influence. But you know what you have? You have a home that loves people. And maybe this is that ministry that God can use you to make a life-changing, eternity-changing difference. If that's the case, then stop by and, and check it out. So to love your neighbor it is to see them with compassion. It's to serve them. And finally, it's to sacrifice for them. Sacrifice for them. Did you catch the end of the, the story? Verse 35. Samaritans continuing, he says, And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. In other words, he didn't just invest his time and his energy. It actually cost him money to love his neighbor. And, and, and by the way, this guy had just gotten robbed and beaten up. He didn't know if he was going to ever be able to pay him back for what he was spending to take care of him. He was willing to sacrifice for his neighbor. So are we willing to sacrifice to love our neighbors? Are we willing to sacrifice to change our world? Because you guys know that Calvary is a ministry of life change. 
And, and this ministry happens because people are willing to sacrifice, to give, to provide resources so that we can lead this community, so that we can lead our neighbors to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And it says something about our love for God and our love for our neighbor by how willing we are to give. Because the truth is, sacrifice confronts our greed. Sacrifice confronts our greed. Uh, see, I said before, all of us are selfish at some level because selfishness is like the, the root of sin. I want what I want, don't care what God says. And greed is selfishness when it comes to our stuff. Right? That, that's all greed is. It's just selfishness when it comes to our possessions, our resources, our money, where we say, hey, I'm going to hang on to that for me. I'm not going to use it for somebody else. And, and so if we love our money more than we love our neighbor... We won't sacrifice for them. But if we love our neighbors more than we love our stuff, then we'll be willing to sacrifice. And, and here's the thing. I just got to commend you as a church, as Calvary, for the way that you do that, for the way that you sacrifice for other people. So you may not understand that the little bit that you do makes a, a cumulative huge difference. So uh, a few weeks ago I told you I'm going to Mozambique and, and uh, we're going to drill a well. And, and you guys started giving and last week I told you, hey, we're almost up to five wells. Well, guess what? Uh, out, now we're at seven wells. And, and because you guys sacrificed and you guys gave. And celebrate that because that's really cool. I'm celebrating it. I brag on you guys all the time. And, and, uh, and that's not where it stops. It's not just people around the world because every time we do, do communion here at the church, we take up a benevolence offering. And we tell you, hey, that offering is to help the needy in our community, people who are hurting and struggling. And, and so in this past year, we, uh, you know, we fed people and we helped them out with medical expenses and paid utilities and rent and fixed cars and all those kinds of things to the tune of over $36,000 of assistance right here in Lake Havasu City because of your generosity. See, that, that's sacrifice for people. And, and, and you can be excited because you're part of a church like that, but are you the one who's helping to make the church like that? You see, loving our neighbor means we're willing to give to see their life changed. It means we're willing to serve them before their life is changed. And it means we're willing to see them with eyes of compassion instead of judging them because they need their life changed. You see, if we do this, if we love like this, our lives and our world will be very different. If we dare to love like Jesus, our world will change and we might just change our world. Jesus is calling us to do that. I'm going to say yes. you got to decide what you're going to say. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for loving us enough to see us with compassion. Even when we rebelled against you, even when we were defiant, you sent Jesus to be a servant to sacrifice himself for our sins so that we could have life and have it abundant, have it eternal. So today we thank you for that gift. We thank you for the way you've worked in our lives. And Father, we pray that you would teach us how to love. Teach us how to see the world differently. Teach us how to serve the world differently. Teach us how to, how to be joyful and sacrificing for this world so that men and women, boys and girls can come to that faith in Jesus Christ that changes their lives forever. And God, we just ask you to keep changing our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and continue worshiping our God.